right, guys, let's get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to um, the second in our series of professional development seminars for the fall 2014 semester. And um, today, um, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Kathleen Irwin. Uh, Kathleen is in the Department of Political Science in the Health Administration Program. And um, she's been working um, with the uh, this process called TBL for uh, about a couple of years now, close to two years, a year and some change. Um, just in terms of our programs, this is right up here. Um, some of you are here as part of uh, the Preparing Future Faculty Graduate Program, and some of you are here who are part of the New Faculty Scholars Program. And uh, Kathleen was, were you New Faculty Scholars? Yeah, so, kind yes, of. a couple of years ago, absolutely, yes. X number of years ago, which, you know, some X. Um, and, um, but uh, what's kind of exciting is that with some of this movement towards more student-centered learning going across the campus, um, last weekend we had the uh, Eric Mazur lecture, which is focused a lot on STEM, STEM learning in uh, different types of learning environments, and Kathleen is uh, applying some of these same techniques uh, in her own work. All right, thanks. Thanks, Raj. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you today to, to share with you a little bit about my experience of what I like to call just diving headfirst into team-based learning. So I'm going to give you a little background on kind of how I got to this point, and then walk you through the tenets of team-based learning, and even give you some examples of uh, some of the things that I've used in my uh, classroom. I am continually learning about team-based learning. It's been a, it's been a process for me. Uh, so I, I adopted a holy at first, but even with each iteration of it, I'm learning more about it. I'm trying new things. Uh, and it's lots of fun. So who can relate to this? Right? No one ever reads, right? You're going to tell me what I need to know. You're going to lecture. Why do I need to read? Give me your PowerPoint. I'm not even going to take notes. I'm just going to have the PowerPoints in front of me. I'm going to look at them and think, I'll remember everything. But we know that that's really not true. Or uh, you ask what you think are leading questions that you think are going to elicit this tremendous discussion in your class to get blank stares at you. You know, occasionally it works, but m more often than not, they just look at you like you're crazy. Or you've got two or three students that are always your good students that always speak up while the rest of them remain silent and just allow other people to do the work. I mean, you've all seen this. So I've experienced that, and I just wanted to, and I would also work so hard. You know, I'm pouring over the material, and I'm learning so much about health insurance, or I'm learning so much about health information technology, more than I ever realized, and it's fascinating to me. And I'm working with students in their major field in the health administration program, their juniors and seniors. I think that they should be turned on by this material, too. If they're not, perhaps they need to rethink their career path. But I'm like, how do I get the students to engage with the material the way I'm engaging with it? Boy, I wish I'd done this when I was an undergraduate. I would have been mortar board or something. You know, I would have been Phi Beta Kappa, which I was not. I'm sure some of you were, but um, not me. I was socializing. But um, <laughs> so, and I do look at them, and I think they must be bored with what I'm talking about. And I'll get to the end of the semester sometimes, and I'll learn from them that we're confused. But even though I ask them to raise their hand, I ask them to ask me questions, I ask them to come to my um, office and speak to me, they don't. They just suffer through it. Right? So I had a, a chance to think about what do I want to do? do I, now I have an undergraduate degree in theater, even though I am a health administration person, I'm a business person, I can stand up and talk to you all day long. I could tap dance, probably sing a song for you, but I always was administration. Can I'm you not get that on tape? <laughs> <laughs> that would definitely spice up the theater series. Anyway, so, but that, I, by nature, you know, I like to perform. I can get up here and do that. Uh, but I usually don't have anybody put their head on the desk, but more, you know, I do, you see their eyes rolling back in their head and they're trying to assume the stare. Uh, so, but what I want, I want students that are engaged. I want students that can learn from each other too. You know, talk about, you know, think about how much you've, you've learned by teaching your subject. Right? So we learn by teaching, I think. So when I had a chance, I guess it's been almost two years ago, they announced they were developing this new classroom in the, in Haley Center, in lovely Haley Center. I uh, started going to a series of seminars. 
and I, I, I signed up immediately. I wanted to do this. But one of the things that I'd like to think about is you know, I did take a graduate course in teaching once, and that was introduced to Bloom's Taxonomy, which I had not heard of before, not being an education major. An other day, I was in a, I was in a, 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 a workshop with a colleague here at the university from another school, uh, Sharon Roberts, a lot of you may know her, and she mentioned something that really just kind of was an epiphany for me. She talked about in her own class, she goes, what do I spend my time on? I am the expert at what I do. In a traditional lecture class, I'm, I'm focused on this, the very base of the triangle, which is the absolute, just the, the grasping of the information, remembering it, memorizing it, regurgitating it. And then I send them home to do higher level thinking in their pajamas, in their dorm rooms by themselves, with no expert in the room. So, you know, we want them up here, right? We want to move them up here. So if we think about the flipped classroom, which you've all heard a lot about the flipped classroom, I think about the taxonomy this way. Let them work on this part. Let's, in, let's uh, find a way to ensure that they're going to work on this part on their own. And then let's spend our time up here in facilitating higher level evaluation, higher level thinking, higher level um, cognitive skills. I just thought, ter tremendous epiphany for me, even after the two years into what I'm doing. So, this is my story. Oh, boom. Okay, my uh, sound clip did not work. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it'll work in a minute. So I, I, uh, I did, not knowing what I was going to do, I signed up to teach in the easel classroom. It's now called easel. We called it the incubator. My little chickens like to still think, call it the incubator. They felt like they were incubated in that, that room. So I started going to the seminars, and, and they were here held in, with the Video Center, and they would uh, model some different techniques. So one of the techniques they discussed was team-based learning. And I was intrigued by it. I mean, I use group work. A lot of us use group work. Um, but and I've used it successfully. But the team-based learning, all that, that really resonated with me. So I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to adopt this. I'm just going to go for it. I'm a whole hog. And the nice thing, what I like about team-based learning, it is a real methodology. It's not just collaborative learning. There's similarities to it. But um, it, it really is very methodical in the way it approaches structuring the class. So I have taught two courses now using this um, methodology. The first course I taught was this healthcare quality management seminar. It was a brand new prep. So I thought, I've got to prep the course anyway. I'll prep it using a new, tech, using new, using new methodology and kind of cut my teeth on it. And so now I have elected, I'm teaching this semester healthcare information systems, which I've taught about 10 or 11 times now and I'm completely revamping it into a TBL class. I feel like I know that class so well, and it, I've, I felt like it would, could lend itself to uh, flipping this class into TBL, more so than the health insurance class that I'm teaching, which I still think could be flipped, but I'm still struggling with that in terms of content coverage, which is one of the, one of the things that you think you struggle with, but it's really not as much of a struggle. So TBL, team-based learning, what is it? So it is a collaborative approach, but it used a very specific sequence of how um, you dole out the work. There's individual preparation, there is testing for readiness to see if they're ready to progress to the next level, and then you spend the bulk of your time in doing hands-on application exercises for teams in the classroom. One of the things you try to do is to, you can come around here if you like, come on. Uh, one of the things that uh, I like about it too is that you really give them time in the classroom to do their group work. There's a lot of advantages to that. They don't have to find other times to meet. You can work on uh, dealing with any free rider issues. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. There's several things you do in terms of those students that don't do the work, you know, that divide and conquer and you know a couple of the students out of the six are really doing the work. And you also can interact with them and maybe help correct or uh, model or move them along as developing as a team. So the key components are, one of the most important things is that you orient your students at the first class about what you're going to be doing. To really help them understand the concepts of team-based learning, um, how it's going to be used in the course, it's different than what they're used to. 
I haven't had a student yet who's really been in a team-based learning course. I think going forward we're going to find that uh, it's going to become less and less because we're going to adopt it more widely across the, the um, campus. Um, but after the orientation, um, you also want to have specific, uh, specifically designed um, permanent teams. It's really important that they start with the same team and they, they keep the whole team throughout the semester. Very important. And there has to be a methodology behind how you put those together. I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Then we go through what is called the readiness assurance process. And this is to ensure that both individuals and then as teams have study the material they were supposed to study before class and are ready to go to the next level, to that higher order thinking. Then doing these in-class in team application exercises, some are graded, some are not. And then also there is a, there is a um, component of peer evaluation in this as well. So they are keeping each other accountable. So basically the course structure I break my courses into modules, and they may range from five to seven modules. I think I'm working with five in the course I'm doing right now. For each module, I have some assigned readings or either videos. Uh, just in my preparation for this meeting, I came across a really neat video of a woman speaking about her English class that she was teaching, and she also gave them a reading guide. So I think going forward, I may create a reading guide to go along with the textbook I'm using. I do give them what I post online. I just post the slides that are sent to me by the publisher, which is basically an outline of the book. And so they can use that as an outline to go through the material, but I think I can refine that a little bit more. I don't lecture. You know, so they have to do that on their own. Uh, they, come to ta they come to class. We do go through a testing process. Once we're through with that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that test in a moment. I can touch on anything that I see that they're not grasping. I can spend a little time in the classroom doing a little mini lecture. And then we move on to, graded to the application exercises. I have maybe two or three per module. I will have one graded application exercise per module. That's what I'm doing in this current class. Um, also in terms of grades, I'll show you in a, a bit, there is both an individual component to their grade and there is a group component, a team component you want to make sure that individuals are preparing so they can be effective members of the team. So, and I also will show you in a little while one of the first application exercises I do is I allow the students to help determine how those grades are going to be weighted. It's a great exercise. So much fun. So we work on group work in class. Often, not, every, not with every application exercise, but especially with the, with the ones that will be graded, there is an individual homework component. So they have to do something at home and bring it to class with them and we're, I'm building on what they've done. So they have done a minimal preparation to take so that they can contribute to that team application exercise to be informed members. So this is kind of the structure of activity and the time it takes. Individually, they do that on their own. I teach an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I'm, gonna tell, I'm gonna give you a resource in a little while about team-based learning, but. This has been used for 25 years. This was started by Larry Michelson in the University of Oklahoma with uh, his management classes that when he was going from having 40 students in a class to 120 and he didn't want to lose what he had. So he's kind of developed this, this methodology. It, but since that time it has been used widely across all disciplines um, and in 55 minute classes and in hour and 15 minute classes. But for me, I take, you know, they come in, they sit down, they take their test. It's a Scantron, and the type of test that it is, it's just, it's big concepts. It's not minutia of detail. Um, I've heard it explained this way. It's, it's table of contents level information, not index level of information. Once they finish their individual tests, they take it together as a group. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a moment then I'm able, with some instant feedback. I think that one of the most important things is through the group testing, they get immediate feedback about whether or not they know the material. They have to discuss the material with one another. That's where a lot of the teaching goes on, where they're teaching one another. Um, you give them an opportunity to appeal. Maybe there's a bad question. Maybe you purposefully put a bad question in there. There's a process where the group can say, well, wait a minute, that's, I know that that is 
the right, the right answer is A, but it says it's C. So you give them opportunity. I have a form. They can take any material they want. They can pull the book out, and they have, it's this methodical way that they can show me uh, why they think the answer should be the other and put, give me evidence why it should be. And so I can elect then whether or not to, to award that team extra points, the points back for that. So you give that process. And I, the first time I taught TBL method, I didn't have a single appeal. I don't think I really incorporated that well. This time I have, and it's really been kind of fun. It's been fun to, I've only had two or three groups try it, but they have, a couple of them have done excellent jobs of making the case for changing the answer, or for the, the answer that they had was right. Um, at that point, I can do a mini lecture and cover anything that I feel like I need to cover based on the, you know, the 10 concepts I wanted them to know. Maybe there's one or two they're a little fuzzy on, and I can give them a little more information. And then, for the next two, three, four classes, I'm going to spend time on application. So in orientation, once again, very important that they know why you're doing this. You've got to get the buy-in. And then you've got to stick to it, because if you go back and forth and back and forth between the methods, I think it does, it's not as effective. And that's based on a lot of the reading I've done. It's been a lot of research done on TBL uh, over time. Uh, one of the things you can start with is your own course objectives. My course objectives go beyond uh, just knowledge and remembering facts. I'm sure yours do too. I'll show you mine in a moment. And I also took an opportunity in my, this is the first class day, to do a demonstration of the readiness assurance process, where I gave them a little test on the syllabus. It was a, you know, it's no, no stakes test, but they were able to kind of experience what that was going to feel like, to take it individually and then to get together with a group and take it. I didn't have my, I think I did that the second class, because I formed the teams the second class. So these are, these are just a, a snippet of my learning objectives. I use domains from um, our field, they're the competencies. And I'm sure like your field, our field is not just about whether they have knowledge of the healthcare environment or if they have business knowledge and skills. Communication and relationship management, leadership and professionalism are also a point of that. So we want them to be able to work effectively as part of a team. There are not many professions you can go into where you're not going to have some teamwork. right? We want them to be able to, to view issues from different perspectives, the give and take. Right? We want them to develop lifelong learning skills. How many are you in healthcare? Anybody? OK, it's going to change tomorrow. Our field, and I'm sure yours are too, I didn't speak to my own, it's so dynamic. There's always something new coming down the pike. And one of the things I try to enforce with them is that they're getting a real foundation right now, but they are going to be studying and digging for information the rest of their lives to deal with whatever is coming toward them. Right. Okay, team formation. Never, ever, ever in TBL use st student-led teams. You don't let the students pick their teams. Absolutely don't. I never have, but I definitely TBL, that is like a cardinal sin. You don't do that. But you want to create diverse teams and you want to be very transparent about the way you um, created the teams. So there can't be anyone saying, well, she put all the good students over in that. You know, th there's no prejudice against them and that you're, you're cherry picking and putting certain people in certain groups. You can do that. Um, what I've done this time, um, and it, uh, ideal size five to seven based on some research, uh, I came up with some sorting criteria. I have 32 students in this class. Uh, I've seen um, work by other folks that have large classes of 300, and they, they may use a certain type of data. They may look at GPA. They may do a survey of their class, and then they use that data and do sorting and do some random sorting based on that. So I did, what I did this time, I had them line up around the wall, and I came up with a list of like five criteria. And whichever group they, they appeared in first, they were supposed to go and line up. So the first one I did was I asked how many people in our class had completed their required internship with us. We require a semester-long uh, internship. It's pretty intensive. And by that time, they are well into the program, and they've gone through all kinds of, um, they go through this aviation management training, a simulation. Uh, they're just, they're, they're really, they've had their foot in the door, they've been in a professional environment. So that's the first group. Second group, I asked if anybody had ever had any 
professional work experience in a healthcare facility. Not just volunteering as a candy striper one day, but so that was the next group. Then I asked for anyone who had completed my health insurance and reimbursement class, because I knew what they knew, hopefully. And then I did seniors and juniors. So I had them line up around the room, and then we numbered off one to six, because I knew I was gonna have six groups. And that's the way my groups got sorted, based on, now I had a you know, critical mass so that I knew that I got a pretty good distribution across those groups. I had one group that ended up being all female. And I t struggled with, should I change that group? And I just let it go. Because I, I, didn't, I didn't know who I wanted to switch. And I thought, no, this is the way, by chance, this is the way it fell, and I'm just gonna go with this. It's worked out fine. It's, they're gonna have a different di dynamic. I do some team building after that. Y'all aren't able to sit in teams here, but we're going to do a little team building here, too. We're going to, so that maybe in groups of two or three. Um, so some of the things I do after I form those teams, I want them to get to know each other. Even though they're all in the same major, some of them are seniors, some are juniors. They don't know each other. They may have never had a class together before. Uh, you may teach a class with a multiple uh, array of majors and ages in there. So you want to give them a chance to to get to know one another and I also want to give them some time to get to know themselves. So I do a real uh, simple personality test with them. They take the test and then they have to, they can see what personality type they are and it's basically, it's called the DISC test and I can't remember right off the top, but it's whether you have a, a dominant personality type, social personality type. And then I give them a, a form that talks about what are the pros and cons of that personality type or the challenges or the strengths of that person personality types in dealing with a group. So they have, a, and, and they all hated the test and they just, they were all laughing about it. I told them I was gonna give it to them again at the end of the semester and they could see if they would changed. Uh, but it, it's a place to jump off and you may find something better than, than I did. So once they're in that group, I then had them do a couple of exercises. First I did a classification game where they could talk about themselves and create an identity for themselves. And then I had them uh, brainstorm a set of ground rules about how they expected to operate for the rest of the semester and what their expectations were of each other. Right? So now I'm going to let you do something if this is, if we're able. I'm not going to give you a personality test, but let's give this a shot. Let's say if we can do this in groups of three or four. I want you to um, talk amongst yourselves and divide yourself into maybe a couple of subgroups based on something that's not negative or prejudicial or discriminatory. And then after that, I want you to find one way to classify yourselves as a group, go building on your subgroups. So, so y'all can stay awake. Y'all take a couple of minutes and try speaking to one another. Maybe if y'all can, at least we can roll. Y'all can probably get here. Maybe this four, and this four, and this four, and this four, and this 27. Maybe. You go that way, and we could do five here. Remember, if you want to, um, in the interest of time, too, if you don't want to spend all your time on the subgroups, can you find a classification for your group? a commonality and the way that you'd like to characterize yourself. Because it obviously, ta you know, or you can keep it with the subgroups, but remember it can be negative, prejudicial, or discriminatory. Um, just classifying yourselves. <laughs> If you're lagging into the next, so the next step of this process, because I know I'm not giving you a lot of time to work on this, but we have such a short amount of time. If we had three hours, we would spend lots of time getting to know each other. The next step after that, after they would come up with a classification for themselves, I gave them profile sheets, which I gave you each a copy of. I had them brainstorm ground rules and to make a list of them and then to settle on their top six. So have, have you ever been in a strategic planning session or any kind of meeting where you went around the room and you asked people for, you know, how are we going to operate? 
and you wrote this. So that's basically what we were doing here in terms of uh, be on time, don't dominate, whatever. So whatever was important for them, I had them now brainstorm uh, rules. And they've all worked in groups before. So it's not like it's the first time they've ever worked in a group. So based on their past experience, they set their expectations for themselves and others. So do y'all want to come up with some ground rules? Y'all are not really going to uh, do any of this because of time. Take a couple of minutes. Let's take a couple of minutes and maybe you can come up, all of, all of you come up with at least one ground rule that's important to you in working with a team in your class, in your major. Okay. <laughs> I know, I was about to say, my students would never say They would say it in a different way, but they would say it in a different way. They would say it in a different way. Okay, so I'm already seeing team personalities develop, which is what happens. It's kind of fun. All right, so, uh, you know, I have an hour and 15. I would spend probably 15 minutes or 20 minutes of time on each of these. So this, you know, this was the second class period. I spent a lot of time in this kind of bonding experience. Uh, and then I, I, I collected their, uh, their papers for them, could scan them, so they also would have a, a document copy in Canvas with their group. I create groups in Canvas. Uh, so that they can remind themselves of their ground rules. Oh, I'm curious, uh, how are y'all related? What's your classification? STEM and social sciences. STEM and social sciences. <laughs> what were you, how'd you classify yourselves? That's okay. Interested in professional development. Interested in professional okay. <laughs> I heard them discuss that up here. Yes. Team outdoors. Team outdoors, woo -hoo. All right. Student engagement. Student engagement. Uh, we all know. iPhones. <laughs> I love it. The, uh, the I group. Okay. <laughs> so I ended up with groups like Trail Mix. Um, I wish I could remember all of them. I had one group. Literally, they came up with the Southerners because that's that was the only ground. That was the only commonality they could find for themselves. And they are my quietest group. You do see personalities. Uh, they just, you know, it's like they. We're not digging real deep. <laughs> but so I, I, I could almost tell from the beginning, I started to see the personalities form. Um, and I could see maybe where I might need to um, spend a little more time wandering over to their group. It's important that you do wander about the room and not just sit at the podium. And it's fun to get in on the conversations of what they're doing. So after we would complete that, we would go, and these are the instructions that I give them, so it's a little, um, it's a, a little small. I actually have this in this syllabus as well. We go through their first group application exercise. They are going to weight the grades. So I have each team decide how they want the grades to be weighted. I'm going to show you. I give them a form. I give them some parameters for it. And once they have com come to a consensus in a group, each group sends a representative to the center. It's like a fishbowl exercise. And then those team representatives then negotiate and come to a consensus on the grade weights. If there's real dissension, they can go back and renegotiate. They have to go back to their group and renegotiate. Uh, when I send you out to the team-based learning website, there are a couple of really cool videos in there where Larry Michelson had taped his group, and now he has graduate students in management, I think. It, it was a real interesting, long negotiation back and forth. Mine negotiated pretty well. It was interesting to hear them talk about how they wanted weighting done. So. They get this, and I didn't, let's see, I'm sorry, this should be, this 25 should be here, I didn't adjust my um, tabs. So there's an individual component, 
There's a team component and there's the, the evaluation, the team maintenance, which is the peer evaluation. So um, within individual readiness, I gave them some parameters that their individual tests could be between 10 and 25 percent. Individual homework could count between 10 and 25 percent of their individual component grade and that their individual topic paper had to be at least 50 percent because it's uh, that's a, this one of their bigger, it's the biggest individual exercise I have. Then I, I set the team performance. I just dictated it was going to be 25, 25, and 50. And so then they could decide which of these components, what, you know, what was the individual component going to count as, what was this going to count as, and what was team maintenance with the, with the instruction that the, one of them, nothing could be below 10%. So obviously what usually happens is they make that one 10%. They make team evaluation and they debate over the others. And you can see then whether they trust each other. And the ones that don't are really afraid they're not going to do, you know, that I don't want my group grade. I want my individual grade. Um, now that they've had a, a seven weeks of class, I bet they'd like to go back and make individual readiness 10%. I think they've made theirs a little higher. Uh, statistically, the, about 98% of the time, the group grade is sometimes substantially higher than the individual test grades or the even so they yes so once they determine this that those weights apply for everybody yes that is the way so this so i go back and i adjust the syllabus and that becomes the grade weighting scheme and that that they so they had some control over how they wanted to uh, the individual and the the team component to um, operate yes have you ever thought about just letting them loose and letting them decide just everything no, because at this point it's so new to me. I'm, I'm, I'm really going uh, using what the experts are telling me based on their experience with it. So I, I, a lot of this, this is not something I've created. I mean, I am, I am living with my, between this book, which is the first place I started, and, I'm, and I'll show you this in a bit, and the, the website, the teambasedlearning.org website, which is not the best designed website, I have to say, <laughs> but there's so much information in it. And, and it's almost like an onion. I keep peeling back layers and, and trying to read, you know, read other, from other people's experiences. But it would be interesting to see. I think they would just be, I think you have to give them some boundaries because they wouldn't, they've never done that before. So I think that it might freak them out a little bit. But we could. Yes, sir. Will it be kind of unfair to be top students, you know, for example, if you consider 20% of the students are top students, they are minority compared to the one that's actually like to do work groups, but the 20% probably prepare individual performance, since they know they're good. So their vote will not count as the whole thing, and the kind of the percentages will be in the favor of the, you know, the 80% of the students are than 20% top. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you should say that. This is something Larry Michaels, and I just watched a video with him discussing this, and he has been doing it for 25 years, and he's only had one student in 25 years score higher as an individual than any of the groups scored on the test. So I think it's once again the power of, yes, they may be the best students, but they don't know everything. And they also have to learn how to work with groups. So, but statistically, I mean, he's, he, after all these years, only one student <laughs> has scored higher than a group score. You know, that's, you know, he, you know, there's consistent better performance by groups than individuals. But yes, and that would be something, you'd be, you know, that's where you see the, con I saw the good students going, oh, I might, want my, I might want my individual test to be higher. They've learned otherwise now. <laughs> so now we have the RATS. Readiness assessment tests, we call them RATS. We have the IRAT and the TRAT or the GRAT, if you want to call it team or uh, group. So with the IRAT, I have, I'm using 20 questions typically right now because I've, uh, it, but you could be 10 questions, 20, big concepts, they come in, they bring a Scantron, they take the test, they hand me the Scantron. Then they get with their groups and I give them something called the if at instant feedback assessment test scratch off card. It's like being in the lottery. They love this. And they take it together. Um, you scratch off. If it's correct, there's a little star there. 
uh, I give them a grade, grading weight of if the first time if they get it right on the first try, they get the full credit. Whether I'm it might be four points, I think I've been doing five, three, and one. Second time around, they get a second chance, they can get credit, but less. They get a third try, three, try, three tries and they're out. But what's interesting is they have to come to a consensus about the answer. So they're having to discuss the material. And if there are any dissension, I mean, they're really having to prove to each other. It's still For me, it's still closed book here. It's just what's here. Um, it's, it's a great process. And I don't know, how many of you went to the Eric Mazur uh, thing? So you saw the video of the students taking the test. I've got something similar, and I'm going to hand out this uh, exam to you. This is, a, this is something um, Jim Sibley, who's another uh, big proponent of TBL, uh, uses this in his civil engineering class. Uh, this is a, a test over his syllabus. It's pretty easy. I think any of you at this point know enough about TBL that you probably can do well with this. And a form. And the thing about the form, uh, they come in packs of four typically. Like I ordered a 500 and it was $110 for this. I'll use 42 this semester, so it's gonna last me forever. They uh, put them in packs of four and they have a code at the bottom on this little perforated sheet. So this is A024, and then I have a guide then that shows me the distribution of the answers. So I can then adjust and my, my test. I even have a, a, a software uh, program where you can generate the test. I didn't find it to be that, I find it just do it easy, it's easier to do myself. That way I can not give the same pattern every time, so now you're going to memorize the pattern of the answers. Right, and then I just, they don't even know about this, and I just pull this piece off. I, when I make the test, I typically will save them in my file as A24, so I know which one I used as well, because I don't want to have to make them all up again. I do not let them have their tests. So this is, Raj, if you can just pass these out. One per person? Uh, yeah, just one per person. I think there's enough, there should be, I have 25. I don't think I have enough of these per person, but just want y'all have a one chance to yeah. want to have a chance to take a look at them. And while y'all are doing this, I I also have a little. This is from University of Sydney. Okay, so here's the first part of the test. Remarkable difference. The, the, the IRAT is just like you always expect. It's that test anxiety. They all look really miserable. They're, and then the room comes alive when they do these. I love, this is my favorite part of the class. Absolutely, I love watching them take these tests. And, and they're so engaged, and there's great debate going on. And I'm just really impressed sometimes with the arguments and the reasoning that I'm hearing from each of the group. So if you want to Try that, try scratching something off and you want to take a look and see what it looks like. Um, these come from an organization called Epstein Educational Resources. It says across the bottom there, Epstein Educational Resources. There's a link to it from the teambasedlearning.org website. They come in different iterations. Uh, you can get them in 10, uh, 10 questions, 25 or 50 questions. You can get them with four answers or five answers. I started off with these, 10 with five. I don't know why I ordered these, because then I had to create, I always have four answers, so I had to completely redo my test and have a fifth answer. So, uh, but they range anywhere from $85 for a pack of 500 of these and upwards. So, any engineering folks in here? <laughs> so, we have our civil engineering test for you. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, I have. I have used this. Uh, I have set up this test to go with that form. This is what, like, the key is really simple. They just send something like this to you. You don't know it. Yeah. You can, yeah, I gave you the answer. This is what the little key comes. It's just a very simple little spreadsheet that they send with the answers for me to do my moving around. I always have to make sure I, I definitely have to prove and triple check because I have given. I have made a mistake before. Uh, no, I actually I take the scantrons and have them scan. But uh, Jim Sibley says he has like over a hundred students in his class. He can sit there and hand grade the scantrons in the time it takes them to do the group. Okay, so if you want to, but they know what they've made. I mean, because they've circled their answers on their, so they immediately know what they made on their individual test without it having to run through the scantron. <laughs> That's why I'm using 20. That's what the, when I did the 10, I would use two 10s, and I'd have to have two different 10s, and it got very confusing. But that was just a mistake on my, in terms of anticipating what my needs were going to be. So I went with the 25, knowing that would give me flexibility to go up to 25. There's usually some, you know, we have to pass around. Y'all were talking about having roles a while ago, so one of the roles would be who gets to scratch off this time. I guess they're, you know, usually they all whip those pennies or quarters out and they get to scratch away. And they really do like cheer like it's a football game when they get something right. Sometimes they're like, wah! My average grade on the individual tests so far have been about 75 or lower, and the average on the individual on the GRAT is closer to an A. It's probably right around an A. They're remarkably different. I am allowing every student to drop their lowest individual RAT score. I give them six; they're able to drop one, which they love because it. I think sometimes like the first one caught them off guard. Some of them did well, but I had some that bombed. I'm talking, I had 50s and 60s. Yes, I do. If you'll see on the score, I let them score it themselves. They get, um, so for 20 questions, I let them have, there's five points for the first time right, three for the second, one for the third, fourth try at zero. So they, they tally it up. I just double check it and boom, there's, they know immediately what they made. They have to discuss the material, and and I also can I then go through as they're handing them up. I'm writing down, you know, which ones did they miss, and okay, well, four of them missed this question, so I know there's something I need to discuss in class. All right. So can you can you see where this would be? How much fun this would be for them? Because they really do feel like they got a lottery ticket, and. And, and the, the teaching, the learning, there's a lot of learning that goes on during this process. It's amazing. Uh, they score them themselves. I, I, um, some people do four, two, and one. I've used five, three, and one, depending on the number of questions. I want it to be, you know, 100%. Uh, it depends on your grading scheme. I mean, you know, based on cumulative points. However, there are a lot of ways you could score it. I know Larry Michelson does his on, like, cumulative points. He doesn't do it as a percentage of 100. Um, but just different methodologies to that. So they have given me their end. They, um, what I do is I keep them in packets. I have a packet for each group. So they all have the same test. They take it individually with a Scantron. They bring me the Scantrons. When I have all of the team's Scantrons, and I hand them the if at form, and they sit down and they take that, they will score it themselves. They hand it to me. I double check it to make sure that, you know, and they're all, they're all, you know, very honest, so I, they've always calculated correctly. But I also take my key and I go through and I mark, I circle the questions that have been missed and the number of times it was missed, and that gives me an idea of what I need to discuss or if I need to discuss anything. So I will spend usually, I probably have about 15 minutes left at this point in the class, 
and I do a little mini lecture. And I also at this point might, you know, assign them something to, for the next class if I have any kind of homework. I use a form, I use a, I use a lesson planning form. I've created one and I, I put sticky notes on it with my ideas of what I'm going to do and what I've been trying to do this first time around is I'm not marking time because it's hard to figure out how much time something's going to take. So I'll just have a little sticky note that says I rat and I'll get a sense, oh that took 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And I'll say G rat, oh that took 30 minutes. Or this application exercise they were completed in 10 minutes. So over to, and I can move things around. So that's a, one of the another little tips, little tricks. And I just created the very simple form um, to use. But also just I've learned the, the better I document what I do, obviously, the, the, I can remember what I need to change, make notes about what didn't work. Uh, if I also sometimes I'll sit in class while they're working and I'll have a great idea. And it gives me an opportunity, I, I can record that idea, I'm gonna try this next time. Um, sometimes you feel like you're not doing anything. Because you're not really, you're doing a lot beforehand. But in class a lot of times you're not doing anything and that's very different and it can make you feel weird. <laughs> but I, 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 I take time, that way you, you would have time, you could sit there and grade their individual tests while they're taking the GRAT if you wanted to. Uh, Jim Sibley, whose test this is, uh, he said he can grade 125 scantrons in the time it takes them to do, his, do the GRAT process. If you want to do that, I typically just take them with me because I figured they know what they made because if they kept their test paper for the GRAT, they've circled whatever they answered. They'd learn to do that pretty quickly. I take up all my tests at the end, though I don't because I don't like creating tests. And I also, uh, in every class I've ever had, I do always look at the, the statistics on my questions because, you know, sometimes we just write bad questions. And we can go back to them and say, oh, I can see that might have been, that was a little, I could see where they would think it might be D instead of B. After they take their group, Rat. This is when they have a chance. If I have a group that says we want to appeal, I hand them a form. They can then pull out their books and sit there and they can, just, they can write a, a written appeal to me uh, about that question or two questions and they'll give me this is the question number and we think the answer should be this or we think that if there is a, there's some confusion about this based on quote a passage from the book. You know, if they can show me the evidence to support why they think the question was a bad question or that the answer uh, could be there were two right answers. Uh, Jim Sibley who, uh, says that sometimes he'll purposely put a bad question in it to see if they'll catch that. Yeah. I've thought about trying that. So far I've just had my own bad questions. I haven't had to do it on purpose. <laughs> okay. All right, so the application exercises, just to kind of, we'll wrap up with this. Uh, they have to be a significant problem. They, all the teams need to be working on the same problem. The problem needs to require them to make a specific choice. And then they simultaneously report their results. Uh, this is something that I, we did this in, um, I'm not going to be able to model this for you today. Uh, but we did this in those seminars that I, when I went through the easel class. And um, we had a group and we had to plan a menu for something. I just remember we, they gave us a pretty simple thing that all of us in the room could relate to. And so we did that. And what I do in my classroom right now is I'm in a regular classroom this semester. I don't have whiteboards all the way around the room like we do in the easel classroom. Easel classroom is great. It's got these glass boards all the way around the room and individual monitors for each group. So. You could have people write on the boards. You could have them create a document or, you know, project it. Some people use like a big flashcard if it's even, you know, a multiple choice type question. They can indicate their answer and everyone can see it. But what I'm doing right now is I use those ginormous post-it notes. Have you seen the big easel pads? And I give each of them one and they may, I may have them diagram something. I may have them answer a question. It may be a yes, no, and then a, a brief rationale for it. When they finish, they go post it on the wall. What I like to do is have, then I have each of the groups, I have them rotate around so they can see the answers and compare it to their own. Um, that way you don't have one group get up and present or give their answer and the other group is over, over there changing their answer. Oh, I didn't think about that. You know, so they simultaneously have to report the results. So 
Um, obviously, you got to prepare. You know, this is one of the. I'm getting better at it, but this was one of the most daunting tasks about this is creating the application exercises. I have been lucky that I've I've gotten some good resources, even with the textbook and some other and uh, other sources where I'm coming up with exercises where I'm asking them to do something specific, where they have to make a specific choice um, that they can discuss. I introduce it, then they talk amongst themselves and they come up with their answer. I circulate. This is one place where you really do want to circulate. You don't want to interject and tell them what to do, but you can listen to what they're doing. They know you're still engaged with the class. You're not just sitting over there, you know, playing Candy Crush while they're working and you're not doing anything. Uh, you can also help if you, you see somebody going down maybe a wrong path, you might give them a little direction to send them in the right, right area. Uh, they simultaneously report, and once you do that, then you can have a full class discussion about differences. Or at this point, I've found this becomes another time where another clarif clarifying moment for me to talk about, well, you know, did you consider blah, blah, blah? And they're like, oh. I didn't think about that, you know, to have them dig deeper. But I'm, I'm really teaching my students to dig deeper, to go beyond, well, the textbook says blah, blah. I said, well, that's great, but think about the circumstance of this organization, what these people have just gone through. I mean, I, you know, to really start using higher thinking power, not just giving me an answer out of a textbook. Critically thinking about, say if I use a case study, I've used some case studies where I have a pretty simple case and they have to come up with an answer and a rationale bef behind it. And, and I was, uh, I love when this happens. I mean, it just, it was, I couldn't have planned it. You know, it was almost unexpected what happened, but it gave me a great opportunity to help them kind of advance in their thinking. Okay, this is the easel classroom. So you can see my students, we were diagramming something on the board. Here, they're in a table format, but they're holding up these cards. And here's a stationary auditorium where they do the same sort of thing. So you're not limited by your space. You know, we just have to work in the spaces that we're given. But it, it's doable in different spaces. Um, here's an example now. This is something, this was from my first class, Quality Management. This is a Plan, Do, Study, Act diagram. Now, in this particular diagram, they are not, they all have a different subject matter. This was further in the class, and I was having them to start to work on a particular project. You know, I might do it differently now. I was, I was learning. But this is just an example of how each of them did a different type of the same diagram. So even seeing how other people did the diagram and how they explained this. This is, we're looking at a quality issue and, and using this plan, do, study, act methodology of how they, you, you plan, you do, you study, you act to make changes in the process of process improvement. And finally, graded application exercises. So I may have, a, you, you first you want to work on, I start with something simple, like the first exercise we do in class is probably pretty simple con concept. And then I may have them do some homework and the next graded application exercise is a little more complex. And then the final one, the, the graded application, is definitely going to be, have the, the most complexity to it. The individual homework component counts as 20 points. So they have to do something in preparation. Uh, then they come in and there's some kind of deliverable at the end, whether it's a diagram, an answer, you know, there, I, I find a way to structure it to give them a grade. So one of the examples of something I've done is I, just recently, I was teaching them about uh, data quality and all, even going up to relational database modeling. So I, they, they've become, they're pretty familiar with uh, clinics because they've all been sick. They've all gone to the med clinic to get their excuse, right? So um, before this in-class exercise, I gave them a patient identification sheet, you know, the, the sheet that uh, is filled out with all of your pertinent info when you go to the doctor's office. And I had them take that sheet and create a data dictionary. And I gave them some instructions about how to do that. So it was baby steps. So I had them do that first. Then. So I give them the scenario that Alice is absent and she goes to this you know, she goes to the doctor and this is what happens to her. I want them to kind of do a workflow diagram of the steps that she goes through in that clinic. And then on top of that, to at each of those steps, what data is collected and at that point. So just starting to think about all the different types of data that get collected. So I did this one day. 
The next time they came in, I, I gave them some videos to watch about relational databases. I even put a relational database map up on the screen to help them. And then I, had, I said, after doing this, I wanted them to start making a list of tables and start grouping that data together. How would they group it? What makes sense to them? And then how, you know, creating the relationships between the tables. So it's almost like a card sort. But this just very, very rudimentary database modeling. But they, you know, I did it in iterations, so they it really started to, to, um, to gel with them. Now, before too long, I'm going to take them into a lab, and we're going to be working with a, an EHR that's been donated to us, and they're going to see all the, the, the table maintenance, and they'll see the tables. Uh, we'll talk about the forms, you know, so they're learning more and more about databases this way. Even though it's not a database class, this is just one small component of this big class. You know, I tell them they're not going to have, they can't take apart a computer, but they need to be able to talk to the people who do take apart the computers, right? They do need to be able to speak to the programmers. So they need to have some foundational knowledge of it. Okay. Any question about this at this point? I mean, you can just think through your own work and what you do and what might lend itself. But I think the important thing is those four S's again. The same problem, significant problem, specific choice. They really have to commit to something. And the more specific, the better. And then that simultaneous reporting to, to generate the larger discussion for you. Yes. So you just give application after application during that, that time period? Yeah, and they take longer than you think. Okay. This would take the, uh, that one step of that would take the entire class. Okay. I give them a plenty of time. They can use any resources they want to use. They're bringing in laptops, they're bringing in iPads, they bring their book. You know, they're digging, especially when we work on the case study. And they're, they're digging through the book, thinking they're going to find the secret answer, you know, but they're having to go back through the material and they have to know it, and they're, or they may bring notes in um, and prepare this. And they, they usually, I may, I'll do one to two. I had the first class I was going to do, I had two prepared, and the second one I thought was even better than the first one. The first one took so long I couldn't get to the second one, I was kind of disappointed. So, you know, like that's why I said I, I keep kind of a running log so I can judge the time it's going to take to do things. You know, by the time they scoot their desk around, they chat and they start talking, it doesn't, it's new for them. It doesn't come as quickly as it might for you or me who knew that material really well. All right, so in closing, I've got a, a handout here that's from teambasedlearning.org. I'm going to, that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about who this might not work for. This basically recaps a lot of what I just told you. Okay, so who's this not going to work for? Okay, this may not work for you if you do not, if you can't figure out how you want your students to go beyond learning and remembering content. And not, I'm not, that's not a criticism by any way. I'm just saying if it's, if it's, if you can't kind of see beyond that in terms of it's so important they've got to learn and remember that content. I told you I'm struggling with my health insurance and reimbursement class. I'd love to turn that into team-based learning. It is such new material for these students that I use some elements of this but I haven't gone full on TBL with it. I do more of the collaborative learning, you know, just occasion, a kind of more casual get together and discuss within the, the classroom. Um, you will get challenged They'll challenge you, especially the more comfortable they get. But So if you don't like being challenged by your students and not take it personally and just realize that they're just engaging and they've got opinions and, and it's, I call them teachable moments. If any of you are parents, you, talk about, you think about teachable moment, moments. I have lots of teachable moments with these students. I learn from these students. Um, if you like doing what I'm doing right now and uh, just always being up in front of them, I don't feel like I've lost any of that. I, I, I do, it does feel a little strange not standing up and talking in front of them all the time, but I really enjoy now that I'm walking around and I'm engaging with them four, five, or six at a time, and I'm listening to what they're talking about, and, and I'm interacting with them instead of speaking at them, which is great. And if, if, it, if you don't want to redesign what you're doing, it does take a lot of time. I'm not going to tell you it takes more time than my lecture courses. It's just different. 
I'm not spending all my time putting PowerPoint slides together and trying to, but what, what's really important is you have to, I've had to examine my learning objectives more closely than I ever have before and to really boil it down to, okay, out of this module on data and information, what is, what are the, maybe the two most important things that I want them to take away from this? And that's how I build my application exercises on what I really want to emphasize and make sure they can walk away with. Uh, that, so that, that's, that's a little different than having, oh, here are my course objectives and now I'm going to lecture and I'm going to give tests and I may have some group projects. So it's just, it's just different and, and it does take, but it, it, it does take time. You get into a rhythm. It was really scary. I was frightened when I started doing this, honestly. I just had, I was like, how am I going to, I'm going to, it's going to be a total failure. But part of that is getting the students to invest with you. <laughs> So I got a question for you. If you have a team of five to seven, will there be any free writers in the, the team, and how do you handle those? Yes, good question. In team-based learning, you it's structured in a way that you really don't get the free writers. They're all having to to take the test individually and then speak together. Uh, they're all having to do some homework and contribute. And one of the neat things that happens is you get your introverted students that never speak up, and sometimes they're some of your best students but they just are so reserved. They feel safer speaking with four or five people than they do in front of the entire class. And what, you, what also occurs sometimes is maybe the one that's quiet, uh, they come to a consensus on the answer for a test. And that quiet person doesn't really speak up. And the rest of the group says, oh, it's B. And it turns out it's A. And she goes, well, I had A. And they're like, well, you need to please you know, tell us next time. So it, it grows. So it gives them a safer environment. But you, you try to structure everything so that you don't have the free riders and they're going to evaluate you at the end of the semester. I have a whole methodology for that too in terms of they're given a, a number of points they can allocate. No one, they can't just evenly distribute the points among their students. They, somebody's got to get a 9 or less, somebody's got to get an 11 or better. They can't give everybody a 10. I, I just read yesterday about a, a group that they do a mid, um, mid-semester evaluation and an end-of-semester evaluation. I haven't done that. I may try it. And they, they um, use a form where they ask them to give them one, something uh, they really like about the way their peer is contributing to the group. And then they, maybe something they would like to see their peer do. And then the, you take that information and uh, kind of assimilate it and give it to those individual members so they can get some feedback about where they are in that peer process so they keep each other on track. All right, so that is it for, yes, sir. I just have one quick question. Um, maybe it's a little bit long-winded, but uh, my wife did a lot of this team-based learning stuff in her major, and when she talks about it, I find it pretty interesting, but I'm an engineer, and one of the questions, I guess, is I've heard uh, a lot of these different approaches and a lot of different people talk about their approaches. It seems like these uh, methods are applied sort of later on in your teaching career. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in our last PFF class was that uh, the sort of the directive was not to, to not go off far off the reservation early on as you're establishing your research program. Um, what kind of departmental buy-in do you really need at this level to implement something like this? Um, because I, I just, I guess coming from engineering, you know, steadfastly holding your tradition, I feel like this would be a hard pill to swallow. I don't know. It's being successfully used in engineering all over the country. So it's in, in, in the health, in the medical profession. A lot of medical schools have gone to this. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. But yeah, I got the same. I'm, I'm in my this. I've just begun my fifth year. Right, this is second career for me. So I was. I'm a. I'm a. I'm an old junior faculty member. Uh, they don't tell me what I can and can't do in my classroom. So I didn't ask for buy-in. I just did it. In fact, they would probably tell me not to do it. But you've got to make that decision for yourself in terms of where you... Yeah, I think that's my... Yeah, that's you've got to make that decision for yourself. And I didn't do it. I did it fall of 2013. So I was at the beginning of my fourth year. But I spent the year before that kind of going through the stuff. But since I've been here, I am committed to teaching. I love teaching. And I do research, too. And I'm doing fine in research. But I'm, you know, and I have the, the expect, you know, their expectations in both. So if anything, I've had my powers of B tell me along, well, don't worry to spend too much on your t time on your teaching. I personally have a problem with that. That's me because I figure that's what, you know, that's just the way the university is. 
They, okay. We hold that research up here, but gosh, this, these students are paying a lot of money to be here. I really appreciate that perspective because <laughs> I feel like yeah. that's, a, that's kind of the my synthesis of all I just did it that. but I had to know what they're they're always you know I've got to know how do I balance what I want to do and the first year I was here I spent a lot of time in the writing initiative because I'm very interested in communications I was communications director uh, and writing in the disciplines I got very interested in that I did a little research on it it's not valued by my department at all so I had to make sure I was doing all the other stuff too understood thank you I have a question. Um, do you feel that the approach that when you adopted the approach did it in any way affect for example, the uh, amount of material you wanted to cover, just because it was, the, the, the time was spent doing different activities, did it affect that at all? I don't think so, because I think, for one thing, for the first time ever, they were reading the entire textbook, right? So I still am covering the same amount of content. I'm spending less time of my time on some of the content. But, I, yeah, so they're having, I'm really putting it on them to go and dig and get that information. Oh, there is no more questions. Let's uh, definitely not dig around a little more.